Hello and welcome to the latest quick fire video from IoT Now. Today we're talking about why it is that the Internet of Things has been so much slower to take off than some people had predicted. And to do that, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Nick Earl, who brings a wealth of experience to his role as CEO of SI. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Jeremy. Great to be here. It's good to have you. Nick, why is it that mass market adoption of IoT has been so, so much slower than anticipated? Well, Jeremy, in a word, it's because of the complexity and, and the data proves it. You know, Cisco famously predicted that by 2020, so one month from now, uh, there'd be 50 billion things connected. Yet Gartner and IDC both agree that we're about nine, 9.3. And actually, 8 billion of those are, are cell phones, tablets. So we've actually only got about one and a half things connected. We're missing 41 billion. And, and it's just too complex. And I'm sure a lot of the viewers would agree. There's just too many manual stages. It's just too complex. So we're in the experimentation stage. And we haven't yet crossed the chasm on IoT. Well, with all that technology that's available to us, why is it that we still see IoT as being too complex to deliver? You know, in my experience, uh, all IT markets go through complexity and then ultimately simplification causes them to grow exponentially. And I think in the case of IoT, there are three areas. I think the device is much more complicated than people think. In our own area, cellular connectivity, people thought, you know, you just whack a SIM card into the device and it will work all the way around the world. Well, actually, it doesn't. Um, SIM cards and modems behave differently um, uh, with different networks. So the same uh, device can behave differently when it's connected to, say, the Verizon in the U.S. versus AT&T. And it certainly behaves differently when you take it to other countries. I think people think that there's global cellular coverage. There isn't. The largest networks in the world, the AT&Ts and the Verizons, have 80 percent, which is coverage, which is fine because that's where the people are. But IoT devices are often where the people aren't. And so you actually need to seamlessly switch between networks. And, and so therefore, you need a, a connectivity service. And the third area is just getting it into the cloud. Clearly, the cloud, the hyperscales, the AWS and the, and the Azures, are going to be the much more efficient way of doing it. Uh, but it's so hard to actually get the ingestion engine working, to get the policy set up, the security certificates. So that's another area. And frankly, all of these things have held back uh, the market, and that's why we're in the experimentation pre phase. So in that phase, how can SI assist companies to overcome those challenges? Well, we're a specialist IoT solutions provider that particularly focuses on global projects. So to take those three areas. Our founders uh, were hardware engineers. They created Zigbee. And, and, and since then, what we've done is we've really focused on solving the device issue. So in our office, where I am today, here, we've got a lot of hardware design people. Uh, we first thing we do with a, with a customer is we say, let's take a look at your device, let's bring it in, let's test it, let's do what we call onboarding, let's let's ship it around the world and, and make sure it absolutely fits for the business case. Most people miss that stage, and that's why you get problems later on. The second thing that we do is we offer switching um, uh, uh, as a service. In other words, cellular connectivity as a service, a single SIM or any net can connect to over 700 networks around the world, many of which were localizing the data, so not roaming. And the net effect of that is we offer 99.85% global connectivity, which is what people want. It means you have one contract, one pane of glass, one invoice. And the third thing is we're a technology partner with, for example, AWS. So we helped write the security solution for AWS Device Defender. So we can take the data out of the device get it into the hyperscale cloud and secure it. And the proof point on that is we just announced last week, actually, with, with um, Gemalto, one of the world's leading providers of modules for IoT devices, the ability to put a Gemalto module in a device, switch it on, zero touch, the data appears in the cloud, the device self-secures, connects to any network in the world. So there is hope that we are actually simplifying these three impediments and I believe that's going to be the trigger for us crossing the chasm. Finally, Nick, can you give us some examples of companies that are using IoT successfully to deliver real business value nowadays? 
Yes, I can, Jeremy. And what I want to do is, why don't I do a, a, a Western markets example and then an emerging markets example. So one of my own personal favorites, I'm a daily customer, is Costa Express. Now, what Costa are doing is, yes, they're delivering a barista quality cup of coffee from a machine, but what they're really doing is disrupting the traditional business model that to sell coffee, you've got to open shops, you've got to take a three-year lease, et cetera, et cetera. So they are, um, there's 90 sensors inside that machine. It collects, we were helped design it. It collects personalized data and allows Co uh, Costa to push personalized advertising to those machines out all over the world, which means they're much more nimble and much more fast moving. And it's a real huge success. Yes, it's a coffee machine, but it's a disruptive business model, which is the promise of IoT. And it's not just the Western markets. In emerging markets, for example, Africa, we have a, a, a partner of ours called MCOPA. MCOPA are solving the problem of bringing day-to-day um, uh, -day household products into remote villages in Africa where people actually uh, pay for it through a phone. They get mobile uh, credit checking. They do micropayments. It's basically higher purchase. And they then put a device into the village, which, again, we help design, brings the power in through solar and means that they, they can buy in a remote village, buy a fridge, buy a freezer, uh, buy a food mixer or whatever, pay for it on higher purchase. And if, if, if they can't keep up with the payments, the company knows and can get the goods back. So it's solving a business problem of how do you get credit checking and, and microfinance out to remote communities where there's massive opportunity and a massive uh, a potential to change people's lives by bringing Western goods into those markets. That is very encouraging after what we were describing before. Nick, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you for joining us wherever you are. Until the next IoT Now quickfire video, bye for now.